will now proceed to our second uh, speaker. And you all know that one of the major opportunities in forest includes ecotourism, such as promotion of eco parks and even botanic gardens, like the Mapini Botanic Gardens that we have in our very own university of the Philippines, the Spanish. So, with that, for our second session, our research leader is the IU Pro Division 6.02.002 Deputy Coordinator and the faculty member of the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources, College of Forestry and Natural Resources, University of the Philippines, Los Banos, sharing with us an expertise about endotourism that's all about Dr. Professor Rogelio Andrade. Thank you very much. So it is an ungodly hour. I hope you're still um, with everyone. And um, I don't like this time slot. I always like my classes to be early in the morning because that's when students are either still sleeping or full of energy. But um, this is what's been given. So let's make the most out of it. So I'm just going to talk about ecotourism in the Philippines. I'm uh, uh, inclined to get my lecture on ecotourism in the Philippines. And part of it is, so at least the historical part, so that, so that um, everyone gets, an, uh, gets acquainted with how ecotourism developed here in our country. So next slide, please. Thank you. So we start with, of course, the definition. And uh, we know that ecotourism is defined differently by different countries. Um, at the moment, the, the country that's leading uh, ecotourism management is Australia. They are the ones who have um, not perfect, but are, are applying the principles of ecotourism properly at the moment. And for us here in the Philippines, our definition is given there, as you can see from the slide, a very long definition. <laughs> But it gives us a lot of detail with regards to the concept of ecotourism and how it is done in our country. So it's a form of sustainable tourism because we know tourism, its industry has a lot of problems um, recently and um, has been getting a lot of issues as well. So it could have, it, it, maybe it was a blessing in disguise that COVID hit and that the tourism is an industry kind of had a reset button, no? uh, that could be a good thing for the industry because we've been doing it wrong for several years now. But this definition was um, developed back in 1999, 30 years ago. Oh my goodness, could you imagine 30 years ago, I was a college student back then. <laughs> so it is a form of sustainable tourism with several elements and the elements are given successively. Tourism that is done in a natural and a cultural heritage area. That means there are treasures in these places where ecotourism is done. Also, there is community participation, a very active community participation. Similarly, there's product protection and management of the assets, the natural resources. Okay, And then, of course, these areas, um, like probably most countries in Southeast Asia will have indigenous people living in these areas. So we need to engage these indigenous people. And part of the products and services that we, we offer to visitors is the culture of these indigenous people. So we have indigenous knowledge and practices there, environmental education and ethics, because we expect visitors to behave in a certain way. We don't just let tourists run around and uh, trash and um, um, do whatever they want in an area, not in an ecotourism site. So we have an expectation on how they should behave. And then lastly, of course, it's all for economics so that the locality thrives economically and lastly, for the satisfaction of the tourists themselves. Okay, so all aspects are covered. The environment, 
the tourists, the local people, and culture. Okay, so even though it's a very long definition, it is very descriptive on how ecotourism should be done in the Philippines. I don't know how it is defined in Indonesia. Probably have similar elements. Yes. Okay. So um, there are just different focus. No? Different countries will focus on different things on the concept. But in our country, we focus on these things. Next slide, please. So that was developed in 1999. So with that definition, our government planned and created a national ecotourism strategy. And there's, there's already two versions of this. One that was developed back in 2003 after the Bohol Convention where the definition was set. Then they planned, they made, they made a plan to develop ecotourism as a national strategy for economic development and social development and sustainable development. Are you guys familiar with the picture, especially those from SLSU? <laughs> so it's a picture of the Pahias Festival, which is coming up in May, you know, where homes are decorated by produce. Uh, see, that's, a, that's a, pra, a facade of a house that's decorated with vegetables and fruits. It's a festival of Thanksgiving for a very good harvest. It happens every May 15. Okay, so it's going to happen next month. Um, besides the first national ecotourism strategy, they crafted another one, which is a continuation of the first strategy. So I'm going to give you some highlights of what happened under these two strategies that were crafted. Next slide, please. Okay, so this was brought about by an executive order by our president back then, 1999, with this. Are you alive back then, 1999? <laughs> 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 Not yet? Oh my goodness. Okay, so I, I, if my guess is right, it's either Ramos or President Fidel Ramos or the, the next president after. Um, then it was crafted by various agencies. Uh, national agencies like the De Department of Tourism, Department of Environment, Natural Resources, Department of Education, uh, DPWH, a lot of these things. Non-government organizations, academe, no? there are various stakeholders that are participating in tourism that help craft the strategy. Next slide, please. And this was funded by the New Zealand um, Assistance Program or NZ, NZA. For the first strategy, these were the main programs. They identified ecotourism sites all over the country. Being an archipelago, it's very difficult to manage sites in different islands, as of course, Indonesia will also know that it is quite challenging you know, to have um, various sites in different islands and manage them at the national level. So there were key sites were identified. There were products that were developed, among which that are uh, among which that you may know would be uh, the River Cruise in Bohol. That's an ecotourism uh, project. Uh, a lot of hiking and camping areas, you know, in in different mountains in the Philippines. And of course, once these products were developed, we need to market them get the tourists coming, and then education and advocacy. Uh, people still need to learn about the concept and the principles of ecotourism. And then of course, some support programs, um, a, an establishment of a national ecotourism fund because other sites may be interested to develop as an ecotourism destination. And this, this fund would be a source of money for them to help them developed into an ecotourism site. And of course, uh, monitoring and evaluation. For the second strategy, um, after 2012, the next strategy were subdivided into planning horizons, the next 10 years. They had short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. And by then, 
many ecotourism sites have been developed all over the country and they wanted to develop um, a tourism cluster so that the destinations can help each other out because it's difficult for just one destination to kind of um, entice vis visitors by themselves. So we need to band together no? so that the tourists are, are more interested if they have a variety of products or services to offer. And these are the clusters that were developed no? uh, from Luzon regions one to three, the Cordilleras, uh, southern part of Luzon, region four, five, and the national capital region. And then, of course, we have Visayas and Mindanao clusters as well. Next slide, please. For the second strategy, here are the programs. So if you notice, it's no longer on the development side, but more on the management and maintenance part, you know, like um, diversifying so that uh, um, areas can become more competitive, uh, maximizing economic benefits for the community, uh, creating conducive environments for uh, investments, a mechanism for sustainable financing because we want the power of tourism to benefit conservation. And lastly, um, um, monitoring outcomes and impacts because we know uh, ecotourism can get a little dangerous when it comes to, uh, when it's not properly done, it can become problematic as we have experienced in the last several years. So those are the strategies for the second uh, ecotourism strategy. And they have to craft the third one. You notice it's 2022, but I think the pandemic kind of halted the implementation of the second strategy back in 2020. So they need to um, craft a new strategy, maybe this year or, or next year. And perhaps that strategy will incorporate the changes that have been brought about by the global pandemic and how the tourism industry suffered uh, during the last two years. Next slide, please. So this is the, the most recent vision of ecotourism in the Philippines. So what we want as a country is for the Philippines to become a, a globally competitive ecotourism destination with its wealth of natural beauty and cultural richness, conscious of the need to conserve, enhance, sustain, and develop these assets and ensure equitable sharing of benefits among its people. So uh, among the most common issues uh, hounding that is hounding the tourism is, industry is the sharing of benefits. Many people who are engaged in ecotourism are not, are not much representative of the local community. No? One, because they don't have the capital to invest. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Okay? And uh, we also know that if not done properly, tourism can destroy our natural resources. No? It's easy to become lost in the economics of things. Okay? So that's another thing that uh, needs to be addressed. And the third thing is that education should be at the foremost. Now, the International Ecotourism Society put forward the element of education in its definition of ecotourism. They want not just the visitors to learn, but also the managers to learn how to take care of their natural assets, of the tourism resources. Okay, so this is the vision. Hopefully it doesn't change because I think it is still applicable in the coming years. Next slide. And I think I have goals, if I remember it right, yes. So these are the goals. We want to safeguard uh, the diversity and the integrity of the natural resources because that's the asset of the tourism industry. Provide education and enjoyment to um, the clientele and deliver income and employment opportunities no, for the local community. So something about the environment, something about the people, and something about the local economy. 
those are the three goals for ecotourism in the Philippines. Next slide. So among the accomplishments, there's a lot. No? Um, there was um, the, um, the development of the strategy for a good analysis of the market. We were able to study which target audience we need to um, um, zero in when it comes to ecotourism, uh, an assessment of the natural resource base, which places possess uh, natural resources that are um, uh, that could support ecotourism enterprises, analysis of the marketing strategies, the promotion. Next slide. Strengthening of the different stakeholders involved in its management, um, the development of ecotourism products, which I think should evolve. No, um, we are we're in the stage where we just copy, which should not be the case. No, um, we should diversify products uh, starting the next planning stage. Development of a website, assessment of key ecotourism sites, make sure that they're doing or they're practicing the principles of ecotourism properly, and of course, continuing with the ecotourism fund, uh, collection of um, funds for future development. Next slide. I think I'm on my last set of slides. Um, expansion of opportunities, development of training modules. There have been standards that were developed because um, we know ecotourism follows uh, some strict set of rules. So there has to be a standard that should be met. And um, accreditation is also um, uh, developed during uh, the, the last 20 years. Uh, income, Income of ecotourism enterprises need to be uh, properly spent, not just for the local community, for the benefit of the local community, but also for the national government as well. And marketing, okay? Uh, proper marketing of ecotourism enterprises. Because we know there's a lot of people who use the term ecotourism loosely, and they are not really practicing the correct principles of ecotourism, but then they use the term. So that's uh, one thing that needs to be addressed as well. And last, next, next slide, please. Uh, some issues and challenges. Synergy between the government agencies, particularly the main actors, the Department of Tourism and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. These two entities are so different from each other. <laughs> one is all about the, the business side, the economic side, while the other one is all about the resource side and the regulation side. So they need to uh, come together and work together if we want to uh, develop ecotourism better in our country. Uh, irregular holding of meetings, everybody's busy, so it's hard to get people together. Fund generation and management, uh, because of corruption, there's a lot of uh, funds that are wasted. Uh, lack of carrying capacity studies. Um, we know that um, a certain area can hold so much number of visitors. So if we um, exceed that number, then we are in danger of um, negatively affecting our resources. Uh, absence of monitoring and evaluation mechanisms that um, keep us... Um, in the right path in practicing ecotourism. And then translation of the national strategy into the local destinations and the lure of becoming more, becoming more mass tourism. So because of the income that we generate, sometimes we get lost. No, we, we, we forget that we're, we also need to protect the environment and the resources that we have. Okay, next slide. I put that because I thought there's going to be a break in the middle of my, my um, talk. So some ongoing initiatives. 
Next slide. This is what we're doing right now. Um, this one is something that I got from the Asian Ecotourism Network website. And uh, I think they developed this uh, post-COVID trend during the height of the pandemic in 2021. If you notice, some of the items here are really uh, pertaining directly to the impact of COVID-19. Like say, they're expecting that people will not be traveling too far, no? more direct flights, less cheap flights because of the added uh, expenses of making sure that everybody is screened, everybody is healthy, okay? coming from one place to another. Um, uh, this one may be true, less group traffic, there will be smaller groups of tourists. Um, the, the free and independent travelers are encouraged because there's less exposure for the pandemic. More private, customized excursions to less crowded areas because um, we know that um, we are, our, our health and well-being is better if we go to places that have less people. And then medium to small size hotels are also encouraged because they are the ones who are capable of adapting uh, quickly to uh, the changes to the new normal. And for the higher end of hotels, this can be a good alternative for wealthy tourists. Um, and then the, the, the offering of products and services will be more focused to well-being, health, no? uh, spirituality, things like that. Not much on just the thrill or just the ordinary tourism uh, offerings before. And then a reduction in mice. MICE is short for meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions, because we know we can do this online, right? So there's going to be less of these things that are happening, which I think is not the case because people are now raring to go. <laughs> uh, people who are meeting virtually before now want to go back to face-to-face -face meetings and face-to-face -face interactions. <laughs> so I think that's that's not a trend that will hold very long. Next slide. Last two slides, I think. So please bear with me. Um, cruise travel, zero cruise travel because many people got infected during a, a cruise. Diba? Uh, a lot of people also got stranded. You know, and these people are the ones in cruise ships. Increase in business travel, more flexible booking options because the, the online platform has developed tremendously during the pandemic. Even payment options are, are a lot more diverse now compared to before the pandemic. Of course, there will be stricter health protocols, safety protocols, less buffet in our hotels, more alfresco dining, more takeaways, more deliveries, okay? and some of the businesses that could not survive during the pandemic will be consolidated into bigger businesses. Merging of enterprises are seen as well. And for the Philippines, last slide before I say thank you. <laughs> so the recovery is the focus. How do we reset? Uh, the tourism industry, the ecotourism industry, the, the country. So incorporating the new normal measures, marketing again, infrastructure development, product and services development needs to diversify uh, planning and um, ecotourism development needs to be given focus as well. Carrying capacity studies need to be done. Valuation of natural resources are also uh, very critical so that we we are guided with how much fees we charge our visitor. And then of course, mainstreaming or incorporating biodiversity conservation to tourism or ecotourism activities. So those are the general initiatives that have been, um, that we've started doing here in the Philippines. So I hope you were able to get something from that short presentation. Um, I hope I kept you awake. <laughs> So um, I'm open to questions now. Thank you.
So, thank you very much, sir, and Jada. So, my key takeaway here is how equity making has covered uh, all aspects, such as environmental, social, and even the economic sectors in the hopes of making ecotourism as a national strategy of economic and social and sustainable development. So, hopefully, the synergies, as you said, about the deal and the Department of Tourism and UNR would be strengthened so this ideal mission of a globally competitive ecotourism in the Philippines could be attained by sustainably managing our tourist site. So, unfortunately, uh, as mentioned in the talk, more challenges are faced by the sector of ecotourism because of the effects of the pandemic. But as part of the youth, as we are, we are obliged to continuously try to evolve and diversify the next planning stage of ecotourism to ensure the success of ecotourism and even enhance the benefits that we need from sustainable ecotourism in the next years. So now we will move to our question and answer protocol, which will last up to 10 minutes. So the floor is uh, now open to any questions that you may have to Professor Andrada. And you may raise your hand if you have any questions that you want to address directly to our speaker. And for the virtual participants, you can also send your questions through Slido, and I can choose from the questions flashed in our screen. So, uh, Very different from simply culture earlier about clonal nursing. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, the floor is now open for questions. So and if uh, so, uh, we will entertain our first question from a uh, please state your name and I'll be for uh, Okay, so thank you so much, Professor Julia Andrade, for the insightful uh, presentations about the tourism in the Philippines. Let me introduce myself. My name is Alice. I'm from Ipsa Entertainment TV, Indonesia. And I want to ask about the ecotourism site in the Philippines. Uh, I haven't seen uh, ecotourism sites from your presentation. So maybe could you recommend us about the ecotourism sites that has been implemented in the strategies of the strategies in the, of the ecotourism in the Philippines? And, uh, why it is effective to be implemented in this? So, one thing I mentioned earlier was the river cruise in Bohol, where they offer um, visitors an experience when they want to enjoy um, the pristine river. What, what was the name of the river? Um, and while they enjoy having lunch, they, they travel through this river, and then somebody is explaining um, the natural resources that can be found in the river, along the river, I mean. And then we also have several um, similar services in Palawan as well, uh, where they also include firefly viewing. That's another um, example of an ecotourism enterprise. Here in our, in our campus, we have our own Mount Makiling, where we offer our hiking and our camping opportunities. In SLSU, they have their Mount Banahaw there as well. So they do offer also um, a form of ecotourism activities there. Uh, recently, I went to Cebu, uh, one that was awarded by the UN uh, Tourism, World Tourism Organization as the best ecotourism village. It's in Alugin San Cebu. It's very similar to what they have in Bohol, but instead of a river cruise, it's much more intimate. There are, I think, about two or three people um, kayaking along the mangrove swamp in the area, and you get to uh, uh, enjoy the local cuisine, and then you get to enjoy as well the local uh, um, culture by hearing songs and performances by the local community. So many of these um, ecotourism areas are in the Visayas and in Mindanao areas. But um, very similar. That's why we need to diversify um, the products of, for ecotourism. We need to think about how we can showcase other aspects of our culture and of uh, the natural resources that we have. Yeah. Those are some just coming down for. Thank you so much, sir. So I'll just read another question from the slide, though. I think it's related to the past question. So what are your personal recommendations to enhance this 
Um, for me, basically, we just need to go back to the definition. <laughs> back to basics. Um, because when things get complicated, just, just go back to the basics. And these are things that we have agreed upon. These are not things that have been invented, but these are things that we have agreed upon by the different state stakeholders. No? If you get confused about something, you go back to the main principles of how you need to practice civil tourism. I think that's the main recommendation that I, I am, I'd like to give. No? Um, and it's good to learn from different people, from different groups, but don't copy. Uh, the, the, the sad thing is um, once something works in one place, they want to copy that and put that in another area. That's not how ecotourism should work. You need to think and look at what you have and then work, work on that for that to be presented to your visitors. Now you can learn something from different people, but you need to develop on your own. You cannot copy what other people are doing. Okay, so those are two things I think that are, are useful recommendations. Thank you so much. So I think we can still entertain two more from the slide. So uh, the second question is, as you have mentioned, uh, mentioned the concept of over tourism. So with this, what are the usual effects or perhaps the most detrimental effects that have occurred due to this issue? Also, what are the strategies advisable to overcome such an issue? Yeah, we that that, that happened before the pandemic. When you, if you are familiar with Quran Island close. Now, that's a very good example of what happens when over tourism takes over an area. You know? The natural resources get degraded, you know? overcrowding, unsustainable practices where you build structures where they're not supposed to build structures, but they have to take it down. So that's the main impact. The, the saddest part of it is that the natural resources gets the brunt of the impacts. And in tourism, especially in ecotourism, your natural resources are your jewels, are your treasures, are your assets. And once that gets negatively impacted, then it's not going to be sustainable. We cannot expect to continue with the enterprise, with a damaged ecosystem or damaged environment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, I think we can uh, have the last question. So among us here in Koji, is there like a deep or standard Koji who has the best for notable ecotourism practices? That's a very good question. <laughs> I've not traveled that much in the ASEAN region. I haven't been to Vietnam. I haven't been to a lot of ASEAN countries. But so far, for Countries that I've visited, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, or Singapore, and uh, Thailand, every, everybody is working their own magic when it comes to ecotourism. Um, I couldn't say one is better than the other because they offer very different sets of products. So it's also, it would depend on the, the tourists themselves, what the tourists likes. So as a region, I think, well, as a region, we're one of the more favorite areas to visit Southeast Asia because we can combine culture and natural resources for visitors to enjoy. And each country has a different set of culture to offer. A visitor. So it's not, I don't find that it's a safe answer, but it's just highly relative. It would depend on the preferences of the people and your background as well. So uh, the best for me might not be the best for you. But one thing's for sure Southeast Asia can offer a whole lot in terms of combining culture and natural resources compared to other. 
thank you so much, uh, Professor Nanda, for sharing your knowledge. And thank you for the question from the delivery. So, unfortunately, due to time constraints, this that will be the end of our training portal. But again, like the first session, if you still have any questions, you can approach any member of the OC so we can collect your questions and have them sent out to Dr. Andrada if you will permit us to do that. Sure. Thank you, sir. And before we proceed to the next session, we would like to take this time to give a token of appreciation to Professor Andrada. So, APRF 2023 Certificate of Appreciation. This certificate is proudly presented to Dr. Rogelio Andrade III for being an outstanding speaker in the International Forcing Students Conciliation, Asia Pacific Regional Meeting 2023, held on the 12th of April 2023. So, this certificate is given as a sign of appreciation, signed by Lawrence Trias and Janelle Balloto and the President of Exa Agustin Rosario. So, may I call on Lau? I start with Lau. He's already on stage. So, the so we are request for a photo of this is a forest you sign. Thank you so much. And before we leave the stage, again, we may uh, request the audience to also come up uh, on stage to, so that we can have a group photo with our second uh, resource speaker. So we can squeeze it so that we can fit in the photo. <laughs> Let's compress guys. I think we're complete. Okay. One, two, three, smile. Stay forestry. Another one as per our photographer. Thank you. Have you watched? Uh, another uh, there's a question that we can if we can have one more picture. <laughs> Or is it Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for participating. So that ends our second session for this afternoon. So before we proceed to the uh, next activities and or sessions that we will have, we will first have a five minute break. So take this time to uh, go to the bathroom or uh, go uh, go to uh, fix your errands 